Well, thanks for, for quite an introduction. Um, yeah, I, uh, uh, I'm from Mr. Specs. We are Europe's largest uh, online optician. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is a bit, well, actually, it's, it's just good marketing, what I think is good marketing. And I've always been into marketing, and I always thought about how you can do it better or more efficient or more effective. And on the way, um, I founded a couple of little agencies, one that is foc focusing on usability, one that is focusing on, on market research, one that is focusing on tracking. And, and if you put it all together, it's really, um, like the thing said, it's being customer-centric, data-driven, and agile, and then, then, then it comes to, to, to you know, then, then, then it starts to really work. And, and I just wanted to give you a glimpse of uh, how we do marketing in Mr. Specs, and it's basically a, a summary of what I collected on my way to becoming managing director of uh, Mr. Specs. Uh, just quickly, like I said, we are Europe's largest online optician. Uh, we sell a larger collection of glasses than anyone else. We do that better, we think, and for great prices. Um, we are court Mr. Specs in, uh, in a lot of uh, countries in Europe. Uh, in the Nordics, we have two companies. One is called Lens Store and one is called Love Eyewear. Both have a great collection of, uh, of uh, eyewear online. You should check it out. It's really great prices and uh, you have uh, uh, an incredible collection. Um, okay, so marketing. There are so many rules about how to do marketing right or wrong or better. And Actually, I think it's kind of lame, but these three are the ones that, that, that we are driven by. And they sound very simple, but they're very, very hard to live by uh, in a day-to-day in -day business. And, 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 and let's, let's, let's go through those three. First of all, customer-centric. It's just seeing your company through the eyes of the customer. It's really, really understanding what the customer needs. It's really understanding how they react to what you propose to them. And, and that's hard for basically two reasons, because customers are sometimes not easy to understand. And, and the other, other thing is that it's not you that needs to be customer-centric only, but all your team needs to be customer-centric. And there are so many in the team. And very often, if you're not customer-centric, they start developing something. And uh, then I always said, well, then I always ask, well, why are you doing that? And he says, yeah, well, because then we don't order this way from the supplier, but we order that way from the supplier. And then I said, well, why don't we do, why do we do that? He says, yeah, because it's more efficient. I said, okay, and, and then and what? And then in the end, it comes out, we should either deliver faster or maybe better, because if you, for example, have values for your eyes, and uh, you need to type them once and twice and three times and their mistakes happen, right? So, but if they know what they, why they're doing it and the other one in the other department also knows why they're doing it, they can control the result and if it's working or not. And just showing you that little example, what we, for example, did was we were sending people to opticians because we have partner opticians and then they, they brought in the values. Why do we do that? So we have better measurements. So guess what? The other people that wrote down the prescription values in-house didn't know what the values from the optician was. And we found out like three or four weeks later that no one was using the new values and prescription values that we had because they didn't know why they did what they did and that no one controlled the process. Anyway, so it's not only about the customer, you also have to have a team that wants to be customer-centric. And in the end, I mean, if you market something and this is like super basic marketing. If, if there's not something that the customer values very, very highly, where you're at least a little bit better than the competition, there's no reason why they should buy. Right? You've got to have something that is at least a, a little bit important or that is important for the customer, where you're better than the competition. And that you need to find out. You need to find out what that is. That's the first step. And this is how we do it, basically. First of all, we look at how do we perform versus our competition. We know how many people know us. We know how many people have visited us. We know how people have converted. We know how many people are loyal. We know that also for our competitors. And then we compare and see how we're doing overall. The next thing is that we try to explain 
why there are performance gaps, why some people who know us don't visit our websites, why other people who know us do visit our websites. Is there a difference? And what is the difference? And then we put all our value propositions in there. We might have a better assortment, or we might have a better uh, delivery, we might have better prices. And then through multi-regression modeling and all kinds of statistical stuff, we find out what is important in that process. And the next thing is very easy. We just look if we do better than the competition or not. Because, like I said, there's got to be one or two things where you're better than the competition. If you're not, there's no reason to buy with you. And then you just sit together with the management team, and these are, you know, I took a bit of data out there because it's from a real study. Um, and, and what you discuss is basically you have on the, on the upper axis, you have, did we measure that it was important for the customer? And on the other axis, on the x-axis, you had, uh, are we better than the competition or not? And then you sit together with the management team and decide on who you want to be, where you want to be better, you know, what's your strategic uh, positioning that you go after. And that you need to communicate to everyone in the company, right? You really need to know, everyone needs to know that. So that's just, just one aspect of, of how we start being customer-centric. It's, it's, it's defining the positioning, starting from the customer. The other thing is, even if you are data-driven and you, 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 let's say your, op, your website needs to be a bit smoother, you know, it's got a couple of hiccups in the process, people just tell you the website is important, the customer experience, but it's not good enough. Well, you know, that leaves you with a big question mark is, um, what can I do to improve that? The easiest thing if you want to be customer-centric is just observe your customers. That's just and, 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 and what you have to do is, is, I mean, there's like the normal usability test. It's like you give the customer a task and say, well, go put a product in the, che in the, in the basket and then go to checkout. Well, then they have a task, right? And then they try to fulfill that. And maybe you find out that there's a usability bug. And it's very good that you do that type of testing. But also it's good to just say, well, you know, go on the web. And if you, if you were to buy new glasses, do what you would do and just sit there, shut up, and, and watch. And, and, and this is just, this is an example uh, uh, from, from Zalando, actually. Like I said, I have a little, you know, bit of uh, small consultancy companies. We, we, we serve quite a bit of e-commerce customers in Europe. And this is just very, very small, right? But this is a guy trying to buy pens, right? Guys usually, at least in Germany, they use SMLXL to define the size. If you looked at the scroll bar, what you had to do to find L is really scroll down all the way. And, and what you got in the beginning is like really funky numbers that I can't do anything about with, right? It's just, if you don't observe how customers use your product, you will just not find out. You can A, B test all you want, but you will not find out that this is just not the right way to do it. So, measure quantitatively what you think the customers you know, want and, and how you perform, and also just qualitatively look at customers, how they use your product. By the way, this is done with video testing. Uh, um, you, you just go into an online, uh, online panel and, and, and book a couple of users, and they just video the session and uh, the voice, and then you, you, it is very rapid and agile. Okay, measure. It's especially when you're digital, right? There's so much data available, and it's really, really easy to measure the wrong thing. It's even easier to measure it the wrong way, and, and as always, I mean, it's very, very, very easy to come to the wrong conclusion. So what, what, what is my take on it? The one thing is, obviously, you, you really think about what you want to measure and structure it. And, and one mistake I just wanted to, 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 to highlight is, I mean, you have to think all the way to the end. If you start tweaking your website and you see your conversion goes up, that might be because people are putting more stuff in the basket, but it's the wrong stuff, especially for prescription glasses, that might be the case, right? You, you, you really tell them, listen, you know, put that, try those glasses, try those glasses, and the conversion goes up, but what they put into the basket is the wrong product, and the return rates go up. I mean, you've got to measure it till the end. 
in the end, you gotta, you, you gotta ask yourself, what do you wanna do, right? And you want, it, want them to not only buy, you want them also to keep the product. So that's just one thing. Then you need to slice and dice it into all the different steps. You need to slice and dice it into all the different perspectives, right? You can do that for new customers and existing customers. You can do it for brand buyers and non-brand buyers. You can, you know, you can look at that. So, so the first thing is that you, that you have a structured approach. The other thing is, and, there, there, and, and that is, there's two schools of thought uh, in data-driven um, management, I would say, especially in big data. The ones say, well, just analyze and correlate, and when the algorithms tell you this works better, then do it. And that's okay, but I like the other way better, which is, Nah, I mean, you still, you still want to manage your business, right? You need to understand why A is better than B. Because otherwise, what happens? Like, make a very, very simple example. If you want an A-B test, right? Let's say a banner on your homepage. And you just A-B test, and you say B is better than A. And that is what comes out of it. And we had that, we had that so much. Okay, so though, you know, what do you do? You, you, you choose banner B, right? And banner A goes to the, to the trash. But well, what happens next month, right? You need to produce banner C. If you don't have a clue why banner B is better than banner A, you're back to the start, right? You haven't learned anything. You need to A, B, test B to C, but you haven't learned anything. If you want to learn, you have to have an hypothesis. A hypothesis could be, well, I think banner B works better because we show faces and prescription glasses, and it's much easier to imagine how that might look. It's better than just showing prescription glasses. So then you A-B test a couple of banners with people and prescription glasses and a couple of banners with just prescription glasses. And if the people banner works better, then I've learned something. So I think the one thing is really you need to form hypotheses before you start testing, because then you learn. The next thing is only measure what you really need. The, the, the other big mistake is, is uh, for customer journey is one, one, one big thing, right? Like the on-site journey of a customer, all the different touch points that he has until he buys. Um, a lot of companies, especially big companies, they invest in a tracking technology that's pretty you know, deep and powerful and everything, and then they wait 16 months until that thing is implemented and tested. And in between, they wait. And I think that's time wasted. I think. If you, if, you, if you start nailing down what you want to know, there might be a quick and fast way to start measuring it on a, on, a, on a broader level, but just start working with the data. So for example, this is a customer journey, right? There's, uh, well, there's many customer journeys already, right? You could start with direct, and then, then you have a Facebook hit, and then again direct, and organic, and whatever, right? If you want to start understanding all those and have the different interaction effects and, and want to want, want to know all of that, right? That might take a very, very heavy duty system and a lot of tweaking and learning and al analysis. But what you really want to know if you look at the customer journey is what is the best marketing channel for me to use, right? Shall I put a little bit more money in banner or should I put a little bit more money in SEM or search advertising? And and the hypothesis is that if you just measure last touch, it's just wrong, right? Because all the banner ads have more first touches, because with banner ads, I reach out to people that haven't heard of my brand yet. So they click on the banner, they learn about Mr. Specs, and at the end, well, they're probably gonna use direct or maybe even a voucher engine, right? So the only thing that I wanna know in the beginning, I don't want to understand anything else. I just want to know which of the channels works best. So what we did, we just pulled the raw data and said, well, let's have a look at just, for example, two channels. And SEM non-brand is all the search engine advertising campaigns that don't have Mr. Specs in it, but other uh, keywords like brand, for example. And, and affiliate. And then look at how many orders we attribute to that channel if we use last touch. And in this case, it's 1,844 for search engine advertising non-brand keywords and 2,237 for affiliate. And then 
you just take that raw data just for, let's say, for a quarter or a month or whatever you will, you know, you just take data in an Excel maybe even and, and, and just have that time frame. And then you do, well, what if we attribute the sale a little bit differently? What if we say the first touch gets 40% of the sale and the last touch gets 40% of the sale and all touches in between get 20 because the first one is important because the people get to know me through the first touch and the last touch is important because it really converts and makes the sale. And then you look at what happens. What happened in this case? Uh -huh. SEM non-brand got much more sales attributed and affiliate much less. That's what usually happens with affiliate because affiliates usually have voucher codes and they're at the end of the journey, and that's just what you find out. And guess what? If you do the same analysis a month later or a quarter later, the relationship between the bass top attribution and the last touch contribution is pretty much the same. So what did, what did we do? We just did that once with, with Excel, tried a little bit, you know, a couple of different attribution journeys, looked at how they moved, and then we said, well, listen, you know, if, if, if my marketing channel manager has a cost per order that he is allowed to spend in SEM, we just find out what he sees, he sees less, if, you'd have a last, uh, if he has a, a weekly last touch conversion, he sees less sales than he actually makes. So he can apply a factor of 0.82 to his CPO that he sees in his weekly reporting, and he can spend roughly 20% more an order than you thought before. And so we did a quick analysis that took maybe two, three months, uh, two, three weeks, right, to tweak it in Excel. Then we found it out. And then the moment we said, okay, you can spend more and you can spend less, go. And, and without investing in, in, in super heavy duty uh, uh, tracking technology. And I mean, there's all kinds of just for the, for the, for the, for the, for the data guys of you. I mean, there's, there's thousands of different, different attribution models that you can discuss. I mean, I would just say we we'll test a few, see what, what sounds logical, reasonable, and then work with what you think fits best and start, right? All right. There is just a third thing because I was introduced as a bit of the data guy, so I'm gonna, gonna focus a little bit more on the data side of things. Um, if you start doing offline marketing, like TV or print or whatever, that's hard to measure. Why? Well, because you do stuff on TV and then you have an immediate impact in the first 10 minutes around your spot. Well, but if you take that, and take the traffic from the 10 minutes and use the conversion that you have and you calculate the cost per order, it's like super, super high. Well, so then, then the marketing guy comes and says, yeah, yeah, but only 15% of the people have a second screen on their lap, right? Only 15% of the people can interact in the first 10 minutes. So let's just take it times six. So it's like, well, you know, it's not like 20% more, like six times more, you know, what's the real impact? And if you want to know the real impact of cross-channel, uh, 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 like uh, of channels across the whole landscape of channels, then something like this might be helpful. So if you look at um, the gray thing, well, the, the light gray thing have been the TV cost, and the dark gray thing is the revenue through TV. This is actually when we started in the middle is when we started doing a bit more data-oriented stuff. And you saw that in the beginning, we spent quite a bit, and the needle didn't move in revenues, right? And then they're, you know, they, they started to, uh, to go into the right direction. And, well, guess what? It, 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 f it looks almost like they're correlating now. There's a correlation. So you can put it into a graph and, and see, well, you know, there, there's, there's probably a connection between how much we spend and how much revenue we make. And then you say, well, because you've learned it in, 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 in uni or whatever, then you say, yeah, well, but if I just put one channel into the equation, um, they might you know, get a higher impact just mathematically than if I look at all channels, so you have to look at all channels, and we do that regularly. We just do regression models on how much we spend on the different channels and what's the impact. And that can get quite advanced because you have a time lag effect, maybe whatever, but seriously, also there, the, the results don't change that dramatically if you apply that the latest and hottest and multivariate analysis, or if you just do a simple regression model. You learn a lot if you do that stuff. Agile. Well, you know, Agile is nothing more than doing your stuff iteratively, 
right? And, and, and what I just said uh, about uh, the customer journey approach that we choose, that was, in my eyes, that was agile because we just wanted to, to know if we have a different attribution and a different result if we do 40, 20, 40 attribution and not last touch. And I didn't need a system, I just wanted to test if it works. So I did it in Excel, we looked if it worked, we shifted the marketing budget and it worked. And, not, and then we invested in more. And that's just, that's just, you should just do that with everything, right? Test small, test a bit, learn, invest in more, learn even more, etc. That is, and, and, and use scribbles. I mean, those user tests that I said, with video or not video, whatever, if you have an, a new idea for your website, right, just scribble it and show it to a user. It's incredible how much they tell you, even if it's just a mock-up. We even do mock-up testing for TV spots. Right? Why not? I mean, you spend so much on TV, why shouldn't you test it, right? Everyone tests A, B for banners, no one tests a TV spot. I think that's a lot of money wasted very often. Um, this, for example, uh, is another thing. Um, uh, we have partner opticians, so uh, you can get an eye test. And in the beginning, we offered it digitally on our e-commerce site, but guess what? We didn't have the functionality because we didn't know if people used it, wanted to use it. So what we did is, if you look at the, the upper hand, that was a voucher, voucher a couple of, you know, time ago. We had students writing voucher codes, right? Taking them out of an Excel list. And then, so we looked digital from the outside, but then people were really writing uh, old school vouchers and sending them out. And then when, when we knew, that yes, people wanted to have that eye test and they wanted to go, whatever, right? Then we did it digitally and now we have a little scan code and everything that you need, right? Um, so putting it all together. Customer-centric. I mean, really try to understand the customer and form hypotheses of what you think the customer wants. Then use data-driven approaches to test if your hypotheses are wrong or right. I wouldn't just test out of the blue, have a hypothesis. It only, only test what you want to test and what you want to know. And move iteratively, right? Start with the basic questions, go to the nitty-gritty questions later, right? But don't start with the nitty-gritty questions because they take maybe a long time to answer. Start with the big stuff. And, um, and that's just the same slide with different wording. Uh, uh, so uh, again, be customer-centric, be data-driven, and be agile. And I think there's three simple rules, very hard to follow in daily business. But if you do follow them, it's, it's highly, 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 highly likely that it's going to help you quite a bit. Thank you so much. Thank you.